Hello, and welcome to today's Idaho Falls Rotary Club program. My name is Liza Leonard, and I'm the president of Idaho Falls Rotary Club. Just want to thank all the Rotarians who are tuning in to today. Uh, and we are once again with IE Productions in their studio, uh, able to bring this to you safely and continue to engage our members. Uh, for those of uh, you joining us that are not Rotarians, I'll just tell you a little bit about ourselves. Rotary Club is an international service organization with approximately 1.2 million members worldwide. Our motto is service above self. And we are always accepting new members. We'd love for you to join us for some of our programs and events. Uh, please find out more by visiting our website, ifrotary.org. Um, well, we just have a little bit of club business this week, and then we will get right into our program. Just want to make sure that everyone is uh, receiving the club emails. We recently updated our system and want to make sure that you are getting the information you need. If you are not receiving emails, you can reach out to us again on our website, ifrotary.org, or please uh, message us on Facebook, and we'd love to help you with that process so that you're getting all the Rotary news and communications. Please also mark your calendar for an upcoming service project that our club has planned. We appreciate our service committee, uh, particularly Josh Johnson, for helping us put together a blood drive with the American Red Cross. That will be scheduled on Thursday, March 11th from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. And we'll send you information on how you can sign up to donate blood or volunteer for the setup or takedown of that event. We appreciate all Rotarians who are willing to donate and participate. Now, I'd like to turn the time over to this month's program chair, Brad Kramer, to introduce today's speaker. Thank you. I'm on mute. Thank you, Liza. Uh, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce today's speaker, uh, PJ Holm. Uh, PJ Holm is the director of the Parks and Recreation Department for the City of Idaho Falls and is a lifelong resident of the city. He received his bachelor's degree in recreation management from the University of Idaho with a minor in business tourism. PJ is a certified parks and recreation professional and is currently looking at obtaining his master's in public administration. He is the recipient of the Greater Idaho Falls Chamber of Commerce's 2017 Distinguished Under 40 Award and the Idaho Recreation and Park Association's 2016 Young Professional Award. He is a member of the Idaho Falls Civitan Club, where he has served as club president and as a member of their board of directors for several years. PJ and his wife, Katie, have been married for more than 14 years and have three beautiful children, Bailey, age nine, Scout, age six, and Parker, age two. And this is not in his bio, but I would just add as a, as a co-work and colleague of PJ, um, is, is just also a fantastic uh, person to work with and looking uh, forward to what he has to say this afternoon. PJ? Thanks, Brad. Uh, appreciate the introduction um, and the kind words. Uh, much appreciation. Thank you uh, to the Rotarians for, for having me today. I, I really look forward to, to having an opportunity to come and talk about uh, the Department of Parks and Recreation and City of Idaho Falls and some of the great things that we do uh, in our community and some of the things that we've, we've experienced over the last year and what we've got ahead. So um, thank you so much for, for having me and, uh, and let's go ahead and get started. So. Uh, in today's presentation, what we're gonna, what I'm gonna talk about uh, um, throughout is gonna be uh, what what exactly Parks and Recreation does in our community, uh, the effects that COVID-19 has had on our department, um, as well as challenges and trends in the industry, funding uh, for for our department, and then what do we have coming up in the future? What's on the horizon for Parks and Recreation in Idaho Falls? So we're going to go ahead and jump into it a little bit about myself. Uh, Brad gave a, 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 a bio on me, so you, you did hear some of that. Um, but I'm, I'm born and raised right here in Idaho Falls and uh, absolutely love this community. Um, I did leave and go to the, the University of Idaho for a, for a few years up in Moscow and, and loved my time up there. Uh, but had the opportunity to come back down to Idaho Falls and work for the uh, Idaho Falls uh, Family YMCA for about 10 years before I, I started with the city. Um, which I've been with the city for uh, seven years now. And so um, I've loved my time here. I've been the director now for just a, over a little over a year, uh, almost a year and a half. And uh, it's been an, an experience. It's been uh, a trying time through the COVID pandemic. And, uh, you know, it's been a, a great learning experience. But luckily, I have 
uh, great uh, fellow directors to lean on like Brad and several other directors in the city that uh, make my job a lot easier uh, to learn and, and progress in as a director. So um, I, I've always been an Idaho Falls Parks and Rec kid. Uh, one of the things that uh, I always like to say that some of my, my first memories of Parks and Recreation was um, when I was young and I remember uh, summer months um, being playing junior day golf and my, my brothers and I had two older brothers uh, getting on our bicycles and using bungee cords to strap the old uh, pole behind uh, golf carts uh, to our bicycles and we'd ride from our house to Pinecrest Golf Course, uh, play junior day golf and then it was kind of a race home uh, so that we could watch the prices right and that was kind of uh, our Monday, Monday morning uh, experiences as we were kids and in those summer months um, growing up. So I uh, had some experience with, with Idaho Falls Parks and Rec there. Um, I also did my Eagle Scout project for the Idaho Falls Parks and Recreation Department. The wood signs that you see that you used to see at a lot of the parks and, and throughout town, uh, the very first year that those were, were routed out and uh, um, put out into our, into our community, um, I actually did the, uh, the prep work for that, sanded, painted, and varnished um, all of those signs the very first year that they were put up. So um, great program and, and uh, another experience with Parks and Recreation. I never would have imagined being the director uh, of this department. I always wanted to be part of the department, but uh, this is kind of beyond my expectations of, of what I ever thought I'd, I'd uh, uh, the role I thought I'd, I'd have here with the Parks and Recreation Department. So that's a little bit about myself. Uh, Park and Recreation Department. Some of this might sound familiar. I know you've had uh, my predecessor and some and and folks come and report about Parks and Recreation in the past, um, but uh, I just kind of like to to talk a little bit about not only what's coming up but what we do in our community. So we have 57 parks, 37 storm retention ponds, uh, 25 snow dumps, 48 right of way properties, two cemeteries, 21 pavilions. 26 miles of trails and pathways and expanding uh, now with our with our future canal trail program or canal trail that we're, we're getting ready to to start this year. Uh, but with that trail program comes uh, 38 miles of canal bank that we also maintain as well. So 26 uh, public restrooms, 21 baseball and softball fields, 11 tennis courts, six pickleball courts, a PRCA sanctioned rodeo, uh, 22 soccer and football fields, disc golf course, uh, three PGA golf courses, a uh, short course as well with that, uh, aquatic center, ice arena, recreation center, Idle Falls Zoo, Sandy Downs, Idle Falls Raceway, uh, Noise Park, uh, seven mile OHV trail out there. We have 26 playgrounds that we're constantly trying to uh, keep safe and, and compliant, uh, two fishing ponds, and a small bike park that's out at uh, Ryder Park. So we, uh, we have a lot of facilities and a lot of offerings for our community. Our department is broken into uh, four different divisions. Uh, parks and Recreation, um, I guess it's broken into Parks and, and Cemeteries Division, the Recreation Division, Golf Division, and our uh, the Idle Falls Zoo. So that's kind of the way that we break our, our staff up and, and um, the differences um, that we offer throughout the community. Uh, as far as Parks and Cemeteries, we've got, um, that's broken into four different divisions as well. Uh, park Maintenance, um, which is basic maintenance of all all property that we'll we'll talk about throughout the presentation, well well as a uh, horticulture and urban forestry department, um, which maintains more than twenty five thousand trees in Idaho Falls and um, and hundreds of flower beds, hanging baskets, and uh, and um, flower pots around the the community. Uh, we've got our two cemeteries uh, that we maintain, and then we have a, a weed and snow enforcement division of our parks. Uh, parks division. So uh, parks properties, just to get a kind of a visual of where they are in our in our community, uh, 57 parks for a total of about 1,200 acres. Storm ponds, uh, 37 of those. We have 84 acres of storm ponds. This is a this is one of those um, a little bit of a touchy subject for us in parks and recreation because it is something that is um, every new subdivision is mandated to to have a, a storm retention pond of of some sort. Um, and because they're typically put into turf to, to be um, a little bit more appealing uh, in a community, uh, they typically come to the, the Parks and Recreation Department to maintain and, um, and, and keep looking good and, and mowed uh, throughout the year. And so that's something that we are, that we are looking at. Um, how do we get away from that a little bit more and maybe ask uh, HOAs to, um, to take on some of that for us? Uh, but that is uh, a lot of property that we do maintain in the community. 
snow dumps and others. Uh, we've got 25 properties for a total acreage of 137 acres, lots of, lots of uh, undeveloped uh, property and, and pastures and that that we do maintain. Uh, right-of-ways in our community, between city right-of-ways, ITD and railroad right-of-ways, we've got 48 properties for a total of about 151 acres. And most of that is single track mowing um, and a lot of edging and, and uh, weed whacking. So it's a lot of handwork that goes into those 151 acres. Trails and canal pathways. Uh, this is something that we, we love to brag about in our community. We have got an amazing trail system, uh, an amazing uh, bike and pedestrian um, trail and pathway system throughout our community. Uh, we've got 26 miles, <coughs> excuse me, of, <coughs> excuse me, 26 miles of Greenbelt and River Walk that currently exist. On the map, you can see it's uh, those are the green trails that currently exist. Uh, the Canal Trail is a is a kind of a groundbreaking agreement that we that we've been able to carve out with the Idaho Irrigation District. Um, with that, uh, it was a three year phased in maintenance approach uh, for us, and and we've actually now completed that third year. So we are we are maintaining 38 miles of canal bank, about 19 miles of of canal. Um, anything within the city limits, we are now in charge of maintaining. Um, that was an agreement that we had to have in order to, to have access uh, to be able to put trails along the, the canals throughout our community. And so we're really, really looking forward to it. I think it's going to be an amazing thing for commuters, for, uh, for uh, walkers and bikers, uh, and those that uh, just want to get out and exercise. So uh, the first phase uh, we'll talk about in a little bit, but we are uh, putting that out to bid this year and uh, hope to be able to get you from about Lincoln um, up on the north end all the way to Community Park um, without ever having to leave a, a, a multi-use path that uh, can be skateboarded on or rollerbladed or biked or walked uh, very comfortably. So look forward to that. Our recreation division, uh, sports and, it's broken into sports and programming, aquatics, and ice arena. Um, very busy, busy staff this year has been a little bit tough, uh, due to COVID, uh, but through our sports and programming, our typical year, we see about 20,000 annual participants, uh, in our programs from everything from, uh, little, little kids playing soccer for the first time and baseball. You can see in the picture there, a pretty young little, uh, batter for the first uh, time, uh, up through high school, adult sports and programs and, um, and not just sports, but we also do programs like, uh, up, up and away, which teaches kids about airplanes and aeronautics. Uh, we took them out to the airport and, and introduced them to some pilots and they got to look at a helicopter and a, and a plane. And then they were actually able to build planes themselves. So we all, we, we, we try to look at this as not just a sports um, side of things, but how do we how do we have something for everyone in our community? So uh, exciting exciting events always happening and activities. Aquatic center, uh, we have swim lessons, public swim, swim teams, lap swims. Um, we are we are heavily using the the aquatic center that's been around since 1986. Uh, we had more than 121,000 visitors in, in 2019. And again, 2020 was a little bit different for us because of COVID, it hit us pretty hard. So um, I'm using kind of our, our years, year numbers from before uh, just to give you a kind of a better idea of exactly how busy our, our, our facilities typically are. So uh, Reinhardt Splash Pad, this is one that I'm excited to, to unveil into the community this, this year. Um, we're hoping that the open date will be on or before uh, May 31st, which is uh, Memorial Day. And uh, it's going to be over in Reinhardt Park on the west side. And we are so excited. It's, it's taken us a long time to finally get a, to be move, moving forward on a splash pad. But uh, I think it's going to be an amazing amenity for, for toddlers and kids and, and teens in our community to really be able to have a place where they can cool off in the summer and do it in a safe um, environment. So looking forward to that. Our ice arena, we have skate lessons, public skates, figure skating, hockey. That is a busy facility over there in Toffus Park. We're open typically on a daily basis from uh, 5 a.m. to 1 a.m. So we have about 20 hours of, of operation a day. Um, we have young, young kids coming in early in the morning, having to get up and, and, and get on the ice. Uh, and then we have adult leagues that play all the way till, like I said, one in the morning, which is very tough and takes some dedicated folks to be able to stay up that late to, to uh, take some hits and give some hits out, I guess, on the, on the hockey rink there. So special events are something that uh, we work a lot with, not only in city, but out of city organizers as well. Um, you know, obviously you guys are, are uh, 
Um, obviously very familiar with that middle picture, uh, the duck race. Um, I apologize that, uh, and I'm sorry that you guys were not able to hold your 30th annual duck race last year, but I'm so excited to be uh, working with you and, and uh, hopefully seeing this thing uh, happen this year. Uh, as, as we hope to see a lot of our programs coming back. But Farmer's Market, 4th of July, War Bonnet, we've got a lot of things in the community happening that are great offerings for community members. Our golf division is something that uh, a lot of you might uh, be very aware of and actually participate in on a regular basis. Uh, we've got three amazing PGA um, courses in, in our community. And um, Sand Creek actually sits, typically sits about the second uh, most played golf course in the state of Idaho. So we have a lot of rounds being played with nearly almost 150,000 rounds between the three a year being played uh, on our courses. So wonderful courses, wonderful uh, facilities, and amazing staff. So if, you, if you're not a typical golfer, get out, come meet some of our pros, our assistant pros. We have some of the best in the, in the country, as well as our maintenance. We have uh, top-of-the-line maintenance staff that uh, keep our, our facilities running uh, wonderfully. So uh, the Idaho Falls Zoo at Toffus Park, uh, you know, the, one of our one of our amazing offerings that uh, we bring a lot of people from outside of our community into the community to come and and visit this facility. Uh, Idaho Falls Toffus Park uh, Zoo was the first zoo in Idaho to be AZA accredited uh, and certified through through AZA. And AZA is American uh, Zoo and Aquar or Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Excuse me. Um, kind of the, the governing body of, of zoos across the country. Uh, and then also we, we recently purchased an administrative building for the zoo and the Zoological Society to be able to share for better collaboration, better fundraising and planning uh, into the future. At the zoo, we've got more than 320 uh, individual animals, uh, about 120 species, um, and 44 of our animals are National Species Survival Plan or part of that plan. Um, which is something that was uh, a program developed by AZA uh, to help ensure that, that uh, certain select uh, species survive out in the, uh, the world, those that are threatened and endangered um, in the wild. It's a great place for, for, to be able to, to, um, to regain, um, uh, I guess, a, a better uh, number of those, I guess, in the, in the, in the world. Sorry, kind of spaced some wording there, but um, also associated with uh, the zoo, the city purchased fun land uh, from the, the private owner um, last year or two, two years ago. Um, obviously, COVID made it so that there wasn't a whole lot of movement over there last year, but we have an amazing uh, committee that is set up for a uh, restoration of fun land um, led by some amazing folks in the community. Uh, this is the, the front page of our website. If you visit uh, funlandatthezoo.com, you can donate to, to improving Funland in the future. You can follow our, our restoration of the facility. Um, but uh, we, we really look forward to making sure that all of our rides are up to par, uh, as safe as possible, but that we can offer programs and or uh, offer experiences, excuse me, to, to folks in the community um, that, uh, that have probably experienced that as, as kids, as adults, as grandparents, and we want to bring all that back together and, and uh, really have a, a gym there in Toffus Park uh, for generations to come. So uh, 2022 is the 75th anniversary of Funland. So that is what we're going to shoot for for our opening date. And uh, I think uh, just stay in, stay in, uh, in contact with us because it is going to be a, a fun ride and it's going to be a beautiful facility when we get it back opened up. Uh, we had some pretty pretty big effects from uh, COVID on our department uh, and the industry as a whole uh, was a tough one for parks and recreation. There's actually a lot of departments that have not offered a single program uh, to their community since last March. Um, folks that are, that are still uh, waiting for it to be safe and, and able to do so. But I'm sure that several of you, uh, probably everyone in, the, in, uh, in today's Zoom, um, saw something in a park around Idaho Falls last year or um, or somewhere around the community um, on the side of the road, a, a, a right of way that, uh, that you were not pleased with. And I can tell you that, that you were not alone in this. Uh, we also, it was very hard for us as staff to, to understand or to, to, grasp, to grasp what the, the pandemic had done to us and our, and our staffing. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our numbers and why it looked the way it did. 
uh, around the community. But, uh, you know, we did our best and we were going to continue to to try to make sure that Idaho Falls stays as beautiful and manicured as we possibly can, can make it with the staffing that we have. So the Park and Recreation Divisions both took some big hits. Uh, we had to cut $750,000 out of our budget mid-year last year. Um, just knowing that, that uh, predicting that revenues were going to be down. Um, and so with that, we, we lost uh, one of our full-time office staff, a marketing coordinator. And the bigger hit for us was, um, was uh, three full-time maintenance positions that we lost in, in parks. So all the, all the facilities that you saw, uh, nearly 2,000 acres of property, uh, is maintained with uh, about 33 full-time employees in the recreation or excuse me, in the park maintenance division. So 33 employees um, typically can do that with about 100 staff members uh, in the season or seasonal staff members in the summertime. Um, we typically sit between 95 and 100. Last year, we had to cut that to 30 employees. So we had 30 seasonal employees, typically teenagers or uh, retired folks that are looking to, to pick up some work in the summertime. So 30 of those and 33 staff members, full-time staff members in Parks Division uh, really, really struggled to keep up last year. Um, we had to reduce our maintenance on right-of-ways and storm retention ponds, which we heard a lot about. Uh, we're going to try to get back into, um, like I said, bringing those back up to, to the right standard. Um, but we're still short some staff and some budget for this year, uh, so we're going to do our absolute best. But The aquatic center was closed for, uh, and the rec center were closed for 10 weeks uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. When we reopened, we were very limited on what services we could offer. Um, and uh, what programs we could offer. Public and lap swim dropped at the aquatic center from about 27,888 uh, swimmers in 19 to 7,024 in 2020. So a huge drop for us, and that was just uh, public and lap swim. So that's not our swim teams and that, which make up the majority of the use of our aquatic center. Uh, swim lessons dropped from 2,759 participants in 2019 to only 140 swimmers in 2020, which is a big deal for a community like ours that we have a lot of water running around. We have a lot of, of water throughout our community and we need our kids to be uh, good swimmers and learn that at an early age. Um, so that really affects the, the safety of our community as a whole when we don't have the ability to offer swim lessons to the masses that we need to. Our public skate sessions have been canceled at the ice rink. Uh, city and non-city events were canceled throughout the year including your guys' the 30th annual duck race, uh, the all 4th of July parade, fireworks were canceled, several summer concert series, beer fest, Cinco de Mayo's, Earth Days, Alive After Five, and uh, one of our big events that we, uh, we had to cancel last year was uh, the 109th War Bonnet Roundup Rodeo, which was a tough one for us. It's the longest running rodeo in, uh, uh, or the oldest rodeo, excuse me, in, in the state of Idaho, and uh, it, was, it was absolutely a tough decision when we had to cancel that. Uh, our golf courses and zoos uh, were a little less impacted. Uh, golf, there we had to we had to lengthen our tee times to ten minutes, which we sit usually about six to seven minutes for tee times, um, which actually over uh, the period of the entire summer made for a pretty significant um, uh, impact for us. Those lengthening those to ten minutes. Uh, season pass sales were down. Uh, and golf association dues were down because people just weren't go joining those groups or paying to, to uh, be part of a group that uh, really what we saw was, was confidence in the consumer was what has been down since the beginning of the, of the pandemic to where people just aren't willing to, to sign up for something that's a long-term commitment, not knowing whether or not it will be canceled halfway through or changed midway through or, or uh, uh, just adapted somehow. And so we saw a lot of those type of things, company outings, shotguns, and those kind of things that were canceled and, and down. What we did see though was a, was a daily green fee increase uh, punch passes were up, short course fees were up, cart rentals were up, merchandise was up. So people wanted to get out. People wanted to golf and buy g golf gear and, and, uh, equipment and get out on the golf course, but they just, they were willing to pay for it a day at a time rather than investing in a season worth of, uh, worth of participation. Then our zoo, um, we were closed for all of April and, and half of May. Uh, nearly all education programs were canceled in 2020. Nearly all of our events and fundraisers were canceled or made virtual, which made it very difficult and, and uh, limited our, our ability to, to make a bigger impact in our community. 
And then attendance was down about 34% at the zoo. So uh, not huge drastic cuts like we saw in some of our programming, but definitely big enough to make a, 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 an impact for us and something that, that was a tough, tough year for us. Uh, challenges and trends for parks and recreation industry. This is what I wanted to, uh, I want to talk about kind of where our country's going and, and where, um, where our industry has to go in order to, to stay on top of, of ever-changing trends and that. Um, we got left, less active lifestyles, technology and highly stimu stimulating entertainment, and then an aging population. People are living longer. People are participating in sports and activities longer, uh, which means that we need to, to think about that as we're building facilities. Less active lifestyle. I like this shirt here. Uh, I think you guys have seen this before, but uh, I'm out of bed. What more do you want? This is something that, that we see as, a, as actually a, uh, kids these days uh, think that, that you know, this, is, um, this is being active for them. Getting out of bed and, and playing their games, that's activity for them. And, and we really struggle with that um, for, for more reasons than, than we can count. Adult and childhood obesity epidemic. Uh, in, in Idaho, 27% of kids are severely overweight uh, or obese, which is a, a, a definite problem. You can see the logos there on the left. That's uh, you know what we can consider one of the, the biggest issues and drivers to this um, is the ease of, of fast food and processed foods, um, a, a, along with those uh, you know the devices that are in your pocket that that uh, you have every information and every game that you could ever want. Uh, in your pocket. So those together are making for a really, a really tough thing for us to compete with. This might be uh, a kind of a familiar picture to, s <coughs> to some of you in this uh, group today. This might, what uh, recess maybe looked like for you when you were in ele elementary school. Unfortunately, this is more what recess looks like in elementary schools today. Uh, teachers do a good job of, of trying to keep uh, phones out of kids' uh, hands during, during the school days, but recesses and lunch periods um, you know, they, they do have the ability to, to be able to jump on those phones and, and, um, you know, and, and, and do exactly what, what you see on this picture, uh, influence those around them and, and, uh, just, uh, not pay attention to what's going on. They're obviously out, not out running around in the, in the fields and playing soccer and participating and playing on the playgrounds like a lot of us did when we were in school. Retail malls of the sixties, um, you know, and again, this is just referencing to what we have to, um, what we have to compete against. This is, this is what, what a mall used to look like. So obviously after a, a, a day at the mall, mom and dad would love to take the kids to the park to go get them wound down and, and uh, get some energy out. Unfortunately, retail um, has become an entertainment destination attraction today. Um, and so you can see in these pictures, you know, you've got everything from theme parks to ice rinks to bright colors and bright, you know, this and that, that that's very uh, interactive and attractive to kids. Um, but why, you know, this is what we're trying to compete with. Why do you need to go to the park after this if, if you get to experience all this while mom and dad are shopping uh, for Christmas? So uh, tough thing for us. Uh, can anyone in, this, in the Zoom um, chat room today tell us um, how many hours a day the average American spends on electronic media? This is one, uh, you know, just a couple of years ago, I remember the same slide uh, was used and it was seven and then it went, I remember the next year it was seven and a half. This year, what it, it shows is that uh, the average Americans use electronic media 11 plus hours a day, which is a scary, uh, scary statistic. One thing I did want to point out though, and I looked at this as I was, as, as I was putting this presentation together, is you can see the second one down there is radio um, with two hours and 43 minutes. I, I kind of feel like that one is, is maybe a little bit of a, kind of makes this a little bit of a lopsided uh, statistic because I, I feel that a lot of people use that as a background noise or a background uh, entertainment rather than something, everything else on there is literally taking the attention from the, from the person in front of it and, and uh, having to use the concentration on that. So even if we took that out though, we'd still be sitting at more than uh, eight hours and, and 20 minutes. So big, um, big problem in, in our country, uh, just getting people off of the couch. Who here has ever heard of nature deficit disorder? Uh, this is a uh, phrase that was coined by uh, Richard Louvre in his 2005 book, uh, Last Child in the Woods. And essentially what this means is kids are in nature less now than they have been in any generation prior. Um, and it makes us feel alienated from nature and, and perhaps more vulnerable to negative moods and uh, redu reduced uh, attention spans. 
Um, everything kids have nowadays is instant. If they want to find out an answer, they don't have to go dig around in a, in a mud pile to figure out what happens to something if it's covered in mud or whatever. They can Google it and, it, and, and see it immediately and see videos of it and, and that. So, um, you know, it just takes the, takes the fun and the learning and the, and the uh, experiences out of, of being a child. Uh, aging population, this is what I, I, um, we had touched on just a second ago. Um, people are living longer. Life expectancy in 1950 was 66.2 years. Uh, in 2020, it's 78.9. So it's increased 12.7 years uh, in about 70 years. And that's a great thing for, uh, for folks that, that uh, um, are getting a little bit older. But, uh, but it definitely, like I had said, changes what we have to offer uh, in parks and recreation because we have, we have to now have, have programs that can move at a little bit slower pace or that can be um, done at different hours throughout the day uh, to accommodate um, folks that are, that are uh, getting a little bit older. Uh, today's parks have to be multi-generational destinations. This is also due to the aging uh, population that grandmas and grandpas want to hang out more with, with their kids. They're, they're younger as their kids are growing. They're still active. And so we have to have parks and, and facilities that can facilitate not only um, a toddler and, and mom while they're there uh, for the afternoon, but, but grandma and grandpa as well and, and other siblings. So um, this just adds to what has to be included in a design of a park um, or facility. And then today's parks also need to provide a balance of both active and pac passive recreational opportunities. Some people like to just sit in a park and relax and enjoy nature. Some like to go to play soccer or basketball or baseball uh, just to be able to get out and, and have some, some social interaction with other folks and, and get some exercise. So we have to be able to offer both a, a, a very good balance of that. Uh, development trends. Um, as we all know, Idaho is booming right now. Uh, the community is growing as fast as it possibly can, it seems like. Uh, anywhere you go in the community, out, out to what used to be uh, farm fields, are now subdivision after subdivision, which is absolutely amazing to see uh, and great for our community. Um, but we want to make sure that, uh, that as we do so, we remember to include things like pathways and we want to be at the table to, to, uh, to help with the uh, planning of those so that we can help incorporate some of those, those facilities that help get people out and recreating. Do you remember a time when we used to walk or ride our bike to, to places you wanted to go? Um, well, nowadays... Uh, you can't even walk to up the stairs to get to your fitness facility. This is a real fitness facility that is in uh, Los Angeles, um, and it's about the uh, the most epitome, the, the kind of the epitome of of um, a uh, of ironic. There, you know, you got to take your escalator up to to go work out uh, at uh, 24 hour fitness there. So um, I, that's one of those things that we're dealing with. But as as those communities are building, if we put pathways in and that. You know, we want to look at this and say, so right now, you, everybody has seen a, a subdivision like this where Tommy lives in this house and Billy lives over here. And because of the way that things are nowadays, Tommy's mom gets in the car when they want to play and takes Tommy all the way around the, the block over to Bobby's house to play. Um, what we would prefer to see and, and what Parks and Recreation would advocate for would put a, put a neighborhood park right there on the corner. Put in a, a green uh, uh, or a uh, multi-use path right here to connect um, the street with with uh, the other section of the, of the site of the subdivision then when Tommy wants to get together with Bobby instead of getting in a car they walk down to the pathway and Bobby walks down down his sidewalk and they meet in the park and play together uh, outdoors and uh, never having to get into a car and experiencing a better uh, um, a better overall experience I guess in their neighborhood those are some of the things that we would love to see happening as, as uh, growth happens in, in Idaho Falls. Um, we're facing funding challenges. Um, competing for dollars in today's uh, uh, world is a tough, uh, tough deal. Um, you know, we, uh, most of our funds come out of our general fund, which is the same place that street funds come out of and police and fire and, and sanitation. And, and a lot of that comes out of that same bu uh, uh, budget. And it makes it tough because there are, uh, aging infrastructures in Idaho Falls, and there is uh, the the need for 
uh, public safety enhancements and and uh, and it, and you know we need a, a police station in our our community and so um, these are funds that we're competing with that when you say hey I would like to to put a little bit more money into a park compared to somebody saying hey we need this to be safe in our community uh, we're it's a tough sell almost every single time so um, so because of that um, grants are critical to help pay for large projects um, in our department. Um, donations by service groups like you guys and individuals um, are crucial for us. TAP grants, state parks and recreation grants are some great ways to fund. Uh, most of them have, have matching funds that are associated with those, um, but uh, some don't, uh, mainly donations. And uh, we absolutely love partnering with, with service groups and, and individuals um, to really stre to, to stretch our dollars to go further and to improve our facilities around our community. So on the horizon, um, one of the things that uh, we're going to, I guess we're going to kind of talk about a few things that are on the board or on the, uh, um, on our, on our plans for this year. Um, one of the things that we are going to work on, and this is something I know is very near and dear to, to several of your, uh, to several of you guys in your heart, uh, is Heritage Park. This is something that has been a delayed long time park that is, has been a, a little bit of a troubling park for for some of us um, in the in the city, um, and I know it's been frustrating for you guys. And I want you to know that the city is 100% behind and dedicated to getting this park done. We are going to do everything we can to progress this thing along this year um, as much as we possibly can. I know that it may have felt like it's it's become stagnant between um, the the administration change with myself coming in as the director. I'm um, trying to learn some ropes and, and step into my predecessor's shoes, uh, as well as COVID has really just slowed things down, made it really tough to get together and have meetings um, and talk about the future um, when it's over Zoom. And it just, uh, you know, I feel that Zoom meetings sometimes can take away the, the creative juices that happen when, when people get into a room together and really can, can, uh, can talk about the future of, of a park or a development. Some of the things, though, that are priorities that we want to see happen this year, and I know that we've been talking about this since 2019, um, but I can guarantee you that that uh, you have my support, you have council support, um, and you have several departments throughout the city that would love to see this pro project move forward. So what we're going to try to do this year is relocate the polls within the next two months. We have ordered the polls. I know that's been something that's been brought up over and over and over for, for a long time. The polls are have been ordered. They have been shipped. We waited pretty much all of last year for them to be manufactured and ordered uh, and get our exact alignment done so that we could we could have those, those polls uh, built exactly to spec. They are here. Uh, we wanted to get them up in December. The freeze hit and they couldn't dig any longer. So we are on the queue to be the first project happening as the ground thaws over there. We're going to get those poles up. And from there, it's it's moving into more park development, I think, than we've seen in the past. So we need to finish and finalize our fill amounts in the park. We need to complete subgrading and final design. And then what we, we, want, to, uh, we want to construct the waterway and water supply uh, Snake River stream that's going to be on the north end of the park. Uh, we would like to see that installed this year so that we can get irrigation in and really get seeding done. And the the trees that your that your club uh, wrote a grant for, uh, the Rotarian trees, uh, we've got to get those. Those are coming in this spring. We've got to get those in the ground and get them watered. So irrigation is a top priority for us. We want to see irrigation, uh, water water brought in, and start getting that that ground finalized to where we're 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 seeing a park. Uh, by the uh, by the end of 2021 so we're really excited about that and I hope I hope that uh, gives you guys a little bit of information about the park uh, maybe put some some concerns to ease but um, you know I've been working with Kevin call I've been working with uh, several folks throughout uh, our community to really try to push this thing along and get it going so uh, I can promise you that uh, we are working as hard as we possibly can at this point moving forward we are getting this thing done so uh, Idaho Falls first splash pad. Um, we talked about a little bit earlier at Reinhart Park, uh, hopefully opening by uh, May 31st. So you can see there on the right, that's kind of the, the layout of it. It's kind of a kidney bean shape, um, about 2,500 square feet of play area. It's going to have a, a little stream that runs through the middle of it. That's kind of that oblong um, kind of uh, ribbon that goes through the middle and just some great aspects to, to this that would be wonderful for um, for several generations or several uh, age groups, I guess, uh, in our community. We've also, one thing that, I, that I've 
I've tried to incorporate into this, <coughs> excuse me, is you can see in the back there a water tower. Um, we are having that um, made up to look like our water tower that we have in Otto Falls that is uh, um, uh, being um, replaced with a, a newer, safer uh, water tower. And so I, I thought it would be kind of a fun thing to, to throw a little memory to, to that um, here on the, on the splash pad. So I think that would be a kind of a fun little feature that you'll, that people will, will really enjoy. Construction of the Idaho Canal Trail. This is uh, something we mentioned. I mentioned earlier. Um, again, what we're hoping to get done this year is going to be from Lincoln uh, down by by Pinecrest Golf Course, um, down behind at, like Linden Park Elementary School, down to about 14th Street behind Lowe's uh, to Holmes, and then down Holmes to uh, Community Park. So that is kind of our phase one and two that we we hope we have funding for. It's uh, about to go to bid. And uh, we are just excited to see that come to fruition and uh, put some brand new trails and pathways through right through the heart of, of Idaho Falls. So uh, we, we want to complete our renovation of the dog park. Um, we, we have it scheduled for a tentatively for a ribbon cutting planned in May. Uh, we've had some great additions. We've put shelters in each of the of the of the different uh, kennels. We actually added a third bay for um, so that we can usually take we we typically need to take one bay out of of use uh, to let grasses uh, re recover and for maintenance. So we built a third so we can always have one down if need be and uh, two open. But we've you can see dog tunnels. Uh, new picnic benches, shelters so that people can get out of the sun. We brought in water, so now the dogs and humans will have drinking fountains in the facility. We've got a restroom out there. We've made some some parking lot improvements to help with draining. So some great uh, some great changes to our dog park, and love for you to get out there. And again, I want to just say thank you to the William J. Uh, Make Foundation and the Make fa family actually for this. Um, part of the the money that was donated for this was from the Make Foundation, and actually two of his daughters, uh, two of Bill's daughters, also donated to uh, to this cause as well out of their private uh, um, lives to to see this facility improve. So thank you, thank you, thank you to that foundation and the family. Um, appreciate you guys so much, and and uh, this park is going to be a, a beautiful um, addition on, and and new development in our community. A couple of things that aren't so uh, glamorous, but that I wanted to mention: new irrigation system at Pinecrest. Uh, we've got an old system that has been limped together and and has been and has ha had to kind of limp along, I guess, uh, over the years. And it is finally time that we've got the funding available to uh, to replace it. It's about a three million dollar project. Uh, we're, but we, the, one of the ben best parts about that is that we are moving from potable water that. Uh, that our, our uh, water department um, um, supplies, we're, we're, we're coming off of that potable water and we're actually gonna be tapping into the Idaho uh, Canal. Uh, so that will save 66 million gallons a year um, that, of water that we've used to irrigate that will now be used for drinking water for, for those residents in our community. Um, so we are so excited about that part. Um, then also another one that uh, that has been a long time waiting is our dehumidification system at the aquatic center. We have struggled with that, and it has been uh, it's been a long time coming to to replace that. The air quality over there has been poor, and we want to make sure that we have a safe environment for folks to swim in, kids to to participate in swim teams in, and um, and so we're really looking forward to having some nice new clean air and a new uh, dehumidification system over at the aquatic center. And then obviously Idaho's oldest rodeo. We love uh, the, the War Bonnet Roundup. The 110th will be this year. Um, we'd love for all of you to come out and join us. Uh, August 5th, 6th, and 7th of uh, this year at Sandy Downs. We have got our fingers crossed that, uh, that the pandemic will continue to, to look a little bit uh, bleaker and bleaker uh, in our community and, and, uh, and that we continue to, to get vaccinated, I guess, and, and uh, move to a to a, a point that we can have large gatherings again in our community and we can have that rodeo. We are, we are excited and hopeful that, that that happens. How you can find us, if you ever want to find um, in information about Parks and Recreation, email. Uh, we do a weekly Discover Idaho Falls newsletter that goes out to about 10,000 folks. Uh, we keep it strictly Parks and Recreation related, so it's no, uh, you don't have to read through a bunch of other information of, of what's going on. It is, um, it's a great email. 
Um, and actually those folks over here at uh, IE Productions help us put that together um, on a weekly basis. So um, get on and, um, and, um, and let, give us your email and we'll, we'll, we'll join you up with that newsletter. Obviously Facebook is a, and, and social medias are a great way to find us. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, our website. Um, so here's our Discoverado Falls. Sorry, I forgot I was supposed to be pushing buttons here. Um, the, here's the newsletter. It uh, comes out every week. It uh, has a little bit of each section. Uh, we've got our, um, our Facebook that, that uh, we're very active on. Uh, our website, you can find information about park rentals, shel shelter rentals, uh, programs, that kind of stuff. Or you can just do it the old way and, and come right into our, our offices, uh, the rec center, the aquatic center, ice arena, any of our park facilities, uh, golf courses, the zoo. Come down and, and talk to us if you have any questions. We'd love to, uh, we'd love to give you a tour. We'd love to, to show you around. But uh, more than anything, we just want to make a good impact in our community. All right, that is the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank the Rotarians for having me uh, come and present today, and I'd be happy to take any questions that uh, club might might have for me. Good. Thank you, PJ. Um, there are a few questions that have come in on Facebook. Um, the first one is from Michael Blennis, and he asks, how can our club be of service to the Parks Department? Uh, you know, we, this is... Um, we could always use more help and we're, we're really bad about, about asking for, for help. It's something we we've got to work on. Um, but you know, you guys typically do a service project with us and, and help us down at the rock gardens to do a cleanup. I know Liza has reached out to me about, uh, looking at setting something up for the year. Uh, and so obviously, um, you know, coming down and, and volunteering with us at that would be would be wonderful, but you guys are, you guys are an amazing partner already. You guys have helped build out so much, amazing recreational facilities throughout uh, throughout our community throughout the green belt in the years um, that you guys have already been a humongous help for us um, what you guys do in the community is is uh, you know is amazing and um, I praise you guys for that but I would certainly say if if we want to get more more pro uh, service projects together I'd love to see that um, otherwise um, come in and visit us and, and just enjoy the facilities. You don't always have to be the one volunteering. Okay. Our next question uh, is about golf passes. What will be the cost for a golf pass this year? And are there different levels of passes? I can't tell you the exact cost. Um, I can tell you that it did go up just a little bit from last year. Um, one of the things that uh, our, our golf courses are self-sustaining. Um, and so when we, when we took on this irrigation system uh, project for Pinecrest, um, we had to figure out a way to make payments on, on a $3 million loan. Uh, we are doing some, some internal loans from the city, and so it is going to cost us very little as far as uh, uh, interest rates um, go. But, but for that, we needed to be able to build up our capital improvement fund uh, to be able to make those payments um, that, uh, that we've got to do for the next 10 years. And so, um, I think each pass maybe went up, a, uh, $60 this year. Um, there'll definitely be different levels, whether it's uh, weekends, uh, five day, seven day age brackets, um, all that should be the same, but you'll see just a little bit of an increase that, uh, but every dollar that is, that is part of that increase goes into, uh, upgrades and, and capital projects for, for golf. Okay, thank you. So the next question is also about golf. Um, this is from Scott Holmes. He says, the National Golf Association stated about a 12% increase in rounds played in 2020. What happened in our community to be down compared to the nation? It actually, it, um, rounds were not down uh, um, much. What we saw, we saw a huge increase to the number of, of new golfers that we saw. And so what we saw was, was less of people playing with their season passes. You know, we, we see people that play a hundred rounds a year. Uh, we didn't see so much of, of that. We saw a lot of first time golfers and a lot of new people trying out the game. Obviously when the pandemic hit, we found that golf and I, I would never have guessed this, but golf was almost pandemic proof. Um, other than us lengthening, our, our tee times to be able to give a little bit additional spacing between that was probably the biggest key, uh, for us, Scott was, was that, uh, was that lengthening, but, 
um, you know, just that alone made it made a big difference. But we saw a big increase in first time golfers. So I have a feeling that this next year is going to be pretty crazy at the golf courses with those that maybe got hooked last year and everybody else coming back that has been playing golf. Thank you. So our next question is from uh, Kelsey Salisbury, and this is has a question and some explanation. It says, any discussion to build a multi-use sports facility in town that can be used for various tournaments, games, practices, and events? With so many large facilities in town, it would be great to see a venue that caters to city-sponsored sports programs, as well as encouraging Idaho Falls to be the host of large-scale youth sports tournaments uh, for out-of-towners. Understand this goes back to funding, but curious on any discussion about this. Thanks for all Parks and Rec does and grateful to be for all the pivots made uh, and programs continue to be offered in our community. Well, thank you for the kind words. Um, as far as uh, conversations of that facility, um, in-house we have not really talked about about a, a field house um, or a, um, a sports complex being being built anytime in the in the near future. But what I can say is that talking with organizers and, and sports uh, folks throughout our community, there's actually several facilities that have that have come into into play and that are also kind of on the horizon for our community that have basketball courts in them and that are um, going to be used for soccer and uh, and indoor baseball, uh, basketball and lacrosse. I know are some that that we've heard from. Um, that will be private, um, privately run in our community, which we support 100%. Um, what we kind of look at in Parks and Recreation is we're here to hopefully help fill the voids and and make uh, make recreational opportunities equitable across our community. And so, if there are good opportunities for kids out there uh, that we don't, as a city, have to have to fill that void, we are a 100% backers of that. And as long as as long as it's uh, affordable and uh, obtainable for anyone in the community. And so I would say, keep your eyes open. There's a lot of training facilities that have gone up. There's a lot of facilities that are being talked about. Um, at least two I know of that should be multi-sport, multi, multi-field, multi multi-court type facilities uh, that will be doing exactly what you're talking about there of offering opportunities for kids outside of the area to come and play tournaments and that here. Okay, thank you. We have time for maybe one or two more. The next question is from uh, Catherine Smith. She says, uh, what do you expect for staffing levels this year? Will you, will you be back at your full capacity? And is your budget back to what it was pre-COVID or will you run again on a smaller budget? We are running on a, a smaller budget, but not uh, not nearly what it was last year. Um, we, we realized after um, last year that we could not um, cut our seasonal staff as much as we have, um, as much as we were forced to last year. And so, uh, we have, we have improved that we have lost, um, a couple hundred thousand dollars in, in seasonal employment. Uh, but we've been able to kind of spread that across, uh, multiple divisions to where it's going to be a lot less of an impact, um, that we saw last year on, on maintenance alone. So, um, we should be just about up to, to par on seasonals at, our zoo as well. Uh, golf really wasn't inf impacted. Um, obviously, one of the things that that happened last year was um, when programming came to a halt. Right, right as COVID hit, uh, we moved our entire recreation division. When we closed down the aquatic center and the rec center for ten weeks, we took all of those recreational staff that are typically planning programs and working with outside organizers, and moved them all to the rec or excuse me to the parks maintenance division. Uh, mainly to the to the cemeteries to help get them up and running for the year, um, and and then our parks in general, uh, just trying to help stay on that as much as we as we could. But after those ten weeks, everybody went back to parks or to uh, recreation, and that's when when we really started seeing uh, some of our parks uh, the the maintenance levels drop significantly at that time. But Catherine, we're 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 going to be better than we were last year, but we are still shorthanded um, from where we usually are. I think there's time for this one final quick question from uh, Lindsay, uh, and that's, are there any plans to allow cross-country skiing and snowshoeing on the city golf courses? <laughs> that is something that I have tried to, I've, let's see, that's, it's, it's kind of touchy because our, our golf courses obviously are, are public and fall underneath the, the parks and recreation department. So me as a, as a, with a recreation background, 
I want to see those things used for that exact purpose. Um, what I do, what I do have to to realize and and accept is when my uh, rec or when my golf superintendents uh, that maintain those courses, um, when they express some serious concern over, really it's over tees and greens are going to be the the two spots that are the real danger. But you know if we have a, a hard pack that goes onto a um, a green, it can be close to about ten thousand dollars, ten to twelve thousand dollars per green uh, to repair that. And so it's one of those that we obviously want to see that. Um, but it's something that we have to weigh on the potential for, for damage and, and cost for us. So we have tried to open up more space for, uh, more spots for, uh, cross country skiing and fat biking and snowshoeing this year. Um, we did open up, uh, for the time that we had snow, at least, I guess, um, out at uh, the soccer complex. We've debated and talked about going out to Sandy Downs. Um, the blowing out there is a concern to, to be able to keep those tracks uh, going. But um, And we had another spot, Sunnyside Park, I think, was a new one this year that we that we incorporated. So we're, we might not get onto the golf courses. It's something I'd like to see. Um, but we are trying to constantly keep keep it fresh and keep new, new spots being open for folks in the community. Thank hey, well, you thank you question. so much for all the presentation and the, the great questions and I'll turn it back over to Liza. Thank you so much. <clears throat> well, thank you, PJ. Uh, really appreciate your time and all that the parks and rec department does to beautify our city and give us lots of things to do. We also appreciate your collaboration on the projects that Rotary cares so much about, including Heritage Park and the expansion of the Greenbelt. It's always wonderful to have a great relationship with, with you and the department. We really appreciate that. <clears throat> Thank you also, Brad Kramer, for uh, arranging today's program. I did want to take just one moment to let uh, fellow Rotarians know about a passing of one of our members. Uh, he hasn't been a member for of our local club for some time. I didn't know this gentleman, but some of our more senior members might remember Lester Keel. Uh, Lester Keel was a prominent businessman in the Idaho Falls area for 45 years, but most recently was living in Texas, uh, where he and his wife uh, settled in just the last couple of years. But some of his history uh, uh, in our community does include his time with the chamber, with the Rotary Club, with the legacy of the duck races, and I'm sure there are some members who, who really value the relationships that they had with, with Mr. Keel and just wanted to pass that on uh, to, to the rest of the membership. Uh, we wish his, his family and, and his loved ones well at this time. Uh, I wanted to mention that next week uh, we have another program that we will be uh, broadcasting here on the Facebook uh, Idaho Falls Luncheon page and on the IE Productions YouTube page. Another program uh, arranged by our uh, program chair, Brad Kramer. Next week, please tune in when we hear from Wyatt Schroeder. The topic will be affordable housing and homelessness in Idaho Falls, a very topic for all of us to, to hear about. We thank you again for tuning in today. Thank you to IE Productions, and we'll see you next week.